Good afternoon, everybody. Today we have Dr. Mazhar Hussain with us on this podcast. He is my father and a well-known doctor in Pakistan. He lived in Denmark for more than 30 years before moving to Pakistan. And in Denmark, he served in the Danish army and uh, also uh, got involved in politics. After moving to Pakistan, he eventually founded my hair clinic in Pakistan, uh, Norway and the United Kingdom. Recently, my father has ventured into functional medicine. Functional medicine focuses on understanding the root causes and the why of chronic disease. Um, he serves his international patients through drmazarusan.com. His main focus is dealing with chronic disease that often greatly impacts on patients' quality of life and their life expectancy. Would you like to add anything else about yourself? I think uh, what, uh, if I were to add something, would be that uh, I graduated in 94. And uh, in the past four or five years, I've been focusing more on functional medicine. And I must say that it has totally changed my perspective on how to practice medicine. And I find it kind of interesting that uh, uh, after so many years, I'm rediscovering medis medicine and I'm getting results that I would have thought unthinkable just a few years back. Wow. Mm. And for anybody who doesn't know, could you introduce my hair clinic and drmazarhussain.com? I was introduced to hair transplantation in 2003. A friend of mine was uh, just starting off in hair transplantation. At the time, the training was much more expensive than I could afford. So I was fortunate enough not to be able to afford it because I had one year where I had to save some money and be able to afford the tuition fee. Uh, and through that year, I learned a lot because I learned why a lot of people are not actually happy with their hair transplant. I think the focus for many patients are uh, like, how many hairs can I have? But from my search and research uh, before uh, I actually had the training, I realized that what really makes patients unhappy is if a hair transplant doesn't look natural. So uh, I was fortunate enough that I had one year where I could dig into that. And I think that's probably the reason why I have a, a very high uh, satisfactory rate amongst my patients because, the, because of the naturalness. And um, what was your biggest challenge in, what was the biggest challenge in your professional career? I think the biggest challenge in, uh, or you could say, I, I think what I have experienced is probably that, uh, I, I'm not sure I would call it a challenge, I think it has been a, an eye-opener, that uh, regardless of how much you practice medicine, uh, you still don't know what the answers are to everything. I mean, you might have an experience with a lot of patients. Every patient is different. So uh, I might think that I could do so many graphs on this patient, I could get these results. Uh, or I might think this patient would surely have this disorder. This patient would likely have a leaky gut. And then if we do an investigation, we realize maybe that is not the case. And I think uh, uh, whether it's a challenge or whether it's, uh, I think it's an eye opener that uh, regardless of how much experience you have as a doctor, uh, the next patient would be maybe totally different from what you have had before. And you can't really predict how is this going to work out. Yes, yes. So this sounds very much like sort of consulting as well, where you have a hypothesis mm -hmm. tested and then you get your results and then mm -hmm you weigh up the mm. evidence with the hypothesis. So mm. that's very interesting. And now we're going to transition more towards um, health-based questions, uh, which are, I don't know if how related they are to functional medicine, uh, but I think that it will be very useful for everybody to actually learn about this because this has personally helped me as well, uh, feel better physically, mentally, emotionally, and it has really helped my personal physical health. Um, so yeah, uh, I'd like to ask about um, sort of uh, what processed foods are and unprocessed foods are and 
what, why unprocessed food may or is good for people? Well, processed foods and non-processed foods, what they are is relatively easy. If a food comes with an ingredients list or if it comes with a barcode, it's very likely to be processed. It's very likely to be produced in a kind of a factory where something is produced on a conveyor belt. And I think it's important for a lot of businesses to minimize their cost. Uh, they need to make their products attractive. It needs to be appealing. So in processed foods, we have a lot of vegetable oils, inflammatory oils. We have a high uh, content of sugars. And it may not say sugar uh, on the ingredients list. Uh, it could be hidden in 50, 60 different names because the manufacturer would very well know that they shouldn't write sugar. And uh, uh, simply I would say processed foods, regardless of what it says on the packing, you can count on it, on it to be unhealthy in nearly all cases. Wow. Regardless of whether it has some fancy thing that should give us the impression that this is maybe related to the nature, it was very original and it has not been altered, but processed foods for nearly uh, all of it is unhealthy to some extent. And non-processed foods, well, they will usually not come with a label. Uh, you could say whole real foods. That would exist even 50 or 100 years ago. You would be able to buy it in the market. That would be the uh, non-processed food thing. Um, and are fats bad for health? So at least my impression was for the longest time that fat is really, really bad. Mm -hmm and don't consume fat. So how does that work? Is, is it good, bad, or could you add some nuance to it? It's, it's a very long story. It's actually a story that is uh, that starts from around 1977. I cannot go into more details about it, but there was this uh, researcher, Ansel Keys, who made a study about the countries that would not fit his hypothesis and he had already made up his mind that fats are bad for you. So he would leave out the countries that did not fit uh, his theory, and he would then present uh, a study where he said that the countries with the highest consumptions of, uh, consumption of fat, they tend to have more heart diseases. And uh, of course, if you leave out the uh, data that would uh, contradict your, your theory, uh, then you can have any theory fit. Uh, into the data. Uh, so anyhow, it's a very long story and it's a quite interesting story. It, I, I think it would be uh, worth discussing just that uh, uh, process alone. But fats, no, generally they're not unhealthy per se. Uh, processed fats though, vegetable seed oils, again, they're produced in a factory and uh, they're altered chemically or they have been heated uh, to create this oil out of something where there's really no oil. For instance, corn oil. Uh, if you take a ton of corn and squeeze it, you will hardly get any oil whatsoever. So it's a chemical alteration. Uh, there's some uh, changes we do to the corn to be able to make some kind of a cooking oil out of it. It's highly inflammatory. It contains a great deal of uh, omega-3 and uh, it's very harmful. So uh, those fats are not healthy, certainly they're not. But natural uh, fats, natural oils, uh, if you have olive oil, if you have butter, if you have animal fat and so on, uh, well, they're pretty good for your health. Uh, obviously, you need proteins. Uh, they are very uh, important also, but um, fats per se are not unhealthy. Uh, depends on which fats you're consuming. So would the difference then between natural fat and the sort of processed factory, food, yeah, yeah, process, uh, the mm. processed fat, it, it, would the processed fat be the trans fat? Is is that the same as trans fat, or is that different? Uh, yeah, no, it's trans fats. Also, it's more inflammatory, and uh, it can lead to a whole range of problems, uh, notably uh, insulin resistance, fatty liver. You can have inflammation in your body, pains and aches. It can. Uh, cause you to gain weight. It can increase the risk of developing diabetes. Uh, it's principally associated with nearly anything chronic. Uh, and we have 
a lot of data to uh, support that kind of statement. Uh, so yes, uh, trans fats is part of it, uh, but uh, there are much more to it. Uh, it's the balance between the omega-6 and omega-3. Uh, but regardless, I'm, I think the focus on fats, uh, the negative focus on fat has uh, never been really scientifically justified. I'm more concerned about our consumption of carbohydrates, uh, which um, we have a huge consumption of uh, carbohydrates, and there really is no essential carbohydrate. There are essential amino acids, mm. the essential fats. Mm. Our body has to have uh, a certain supply of certain fats and certain proteins. But there is nothing our body requires in terms of carbohydrates. I'm not saying you should not consume carbohydrates at all, but they're not required for our body to function properly. Uh, the misunderstanding is that maybe the glucose, we need it for the glucose, but the body is fully capable of producing whatever glucose it needs by itself. And in terms of um, sort of vegetables and fruits um, are both good for you or are vegetables generally better and um, in terms of fruits are fruits generally good uh, by and large or or is it a mix of both I would say that if you have whole foods uh, generally speaking uh, nearly all fruits would also be good and acceptable However, uh, that would be for a person who is already healthy. If you have developed diabetes, if you are overweight, if you have uh, other chronic issues, then you might have to reset your body before you start venturing into uh, having fruits with a high uh, fructose content. Uh, so uh, fruits per se are not bad, but if your starting point is some chronic illness, uh, I would in Quite a few patients ask them to dial down on the fruits, especially if they have a high uh, fructose content. But if you're otherwise healthy, your body is optimized, your numbers are good, you're not overweight, you're not having any kind of allergies, issues, IBS, uh, no inflammation in your body. Well, then I would say any whole foods uh, would be fine. Uh, I'm not seeing any issues with that, uh, whole foods in that case. Okay, and and how has agriculture changed over the past few decades or century? Oh, that's uh, that's a huge subject. Uh, it has changed a lot in many many ways. Uh, we use a lot of pesticides. Uh, we try to the corporate agriculture. Uh, everything's about producing as much as possible at the lowest possible cost. Uh, and the uh, yield from the same uh, uh, piece of land is now four times greater in some industrialized countries than it was just 100, 150 years ago. And the soil can simply not uh, replenish itself with the nutrients, the micronutrients that we want. We might be getting the carbs uh, that we would want, we might be getting the calories uh, from the food, but uh, a lot of places we'd see that uh, the produce would contain less uh, micronutrients, uh, magnesium, selenium, copper, zinc. Uh, and those things uh, we see in too many patients, they're suffering from some kind of deficiency. Uh, I've not really come across anyone seeking my assistance that did not have some kind of deficiency. So. Uh, that just goes to illustrate uh, how we have changed our food. Uh, it's not just about the agriculture because our, apart from the agriculture, our food culture has changed because more and more people, even in the developing countries, are having fast food. So it's not just about the agriculture. Maybe if we were to just eat whole foods, even the modified change, GMO whole foods, we might still be able to do better. And Exactly. That actually leads me to my next question. Have animals changed? So uh, is GMO much more common now or is it uh, or is it impacting a lot or have animals changed because of their diets now? Like were they fed something else before and they're fed something else now or um, even if they're fed the same stuff, does that have the same nutrients that 
the previous stuff that they were fed. Um, so does that have any impact on the animals themselves or? We have changed our livestock uh, considerably and uh, we use a great deal of antibiotics. Hmm. Uh, it changes the complete uh, setup and the health of the animal. Uh, we want uh, to produce as much as possible. Uh, you know, the caged chicken, uh, they're kept in a very limited space. From uh, the, They're developed over the course of maybe 19 to 21 days, going from a chick to a full-blown chicken and then being sold in the market. And uh, from here in Pakistan, you've seen the what we call the desi ki or the traditional, uh, uh, sorry, desi chicken. Uh, the traditional chickens uh, that uh, would be raised maybe somewhere uh, in the villages and it will take them maybe six months to uh, be ready to uh, be eaten. And the meat quality is totally different. We have uh, grass-fed animals originally and now we have grain-fed uh, animals. And even animals uh, are given, uh, uh, animals that are vegetarians are given uh, 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 animal product uh, to increase and they're given antibiotics and so on. Uh, so we are trying to just make it as effective as possible, make the best kind of money out of it. But it is at a cost. And uh, I mean, if I had the option, I'd rather have uh, grass-fed uh, animals, certainly. I'd rather have uh, meat from animals that have not been given a lot of antibiotics and uh, that has actually been out uh, and about uh, being used been using their body physically and uh, have lived a healthy life rather than a stressful life uh, where they're confined to a very limited space not being able to move about and not being able to use their body as nature wanted them to use it wanted them to use yes and 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 so all of this uh, this then has an impact on the nutrients that that then we are that we actually end up having in our bodies right yes. like magnesium mm. calcium I, I don't know about calcium but that would be from the a lot of that would be from the so, uh, plant-based yeah uh, but uh, yeah we do have other issues with the animal-based yeah. food also so so, so so hence, it, this then leads me to the question about vitamins or vitamins and minerals. Should, is it a good idea to, to consume this, uh, considering that that intake uh, is no longer there, right? Or that level that, that we had before, right? That we of minerals and vitamins just isn't there anymore. Yeah, I think the... Principally, I would say it would be a better option if we wouldn't need any supplements. Uh, and uh, I don't think nature wanted us to develop what we have developed, a system where animals and foods are produced in a way that uh, they lack important nutrients. But the reality is that uh, a lot of people today only have access to food uh, that would be lacking in nutrients. Even if they opt out of fast food, if they buy it from the local market uh, the stores, uh, you'd find a lot of those things would have a high carbs content, high content of inflammatory fats, and the nutrition value would be less. And uh, because the food is now lacking the micronutrients, that is the reason why I believe a lot of people have to have uh, supplements, uh, simply because... It's not contained in, it's not already there in the food, in, the, in their diet. So it's more out of necessity rather than I think it's natural. It's not natural, but the food we are eating is not natural. And it's kind of compensating that uh, unnatural food and the food that is then lacking in nutrients that we have to uh, 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 make use of um, supplements. Very interesting. and. I am now going to transition to question, questioning my dad uh, about his views on some social issues. So I wanted to ask you, so 
my experience um so i lived here until i was 19 right in in pakistan and when i went abroad uh, i took a very sciencey subject as you know and i've continued to work in sort of uh, tech etc but um my experience was that it was at least within the sort of science subjects people really weren't a fan of any sort of spirituality. So I wanted to ask you, do you think spirituality has value or do you think science uh, shows that it, it has very little value and it really doesn't matter that much? Um, I think uh, the question here would be between spirituality and religion versus natural sciences. Um, I think science or medical science shows us that people need some kind of spirituality. Uh, whether it has to do with religion, it's not required. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, linked to religion. But for better health, you need uh, spirituality can help you. And we know from uh, studies that uh, people that are able, and we use it in functional medicine actually, we, are, we, we want the patients to, uh, to, ha to kind of acknowledge, have gratitude kind of, and to acknowledge that uh, maybe things are not working the best in certain ways. But on the other hand, we can opt to count our blessings. And if we are kind of uh, appreciating what we have and appreciating the positive in our life, uh, the, what we have achieved, uh, what we are not missing, rather than focusing on what is missing in our lives. Um, if you look at it, I mean, if, if you have a shelter, if you have a bed, if you are having three meals a day, yeah. then you're better off than many, many people in the world. And if you learn to appreciate that and uh, maybe uh, be happy about what ha you have gained, what you have achieved. Uh, we know a positive mindset can actually improve your health. So to me, it's not about whether I think, I don't think, but we know from studies simply that uh, how you perceive the world has a great impact on how happy you are and how healthy you are. And we also know from studies that uh, one of the greatest determinants is how much of a network do you have? How much can you rely on your network? Should you need them for one reason or the other? And having that feel of safety and security that there are people around you. So I think the whole discussion about uh, whether God exists or not, I, I don't think that has to be relevant. I'm not sure it has to be, we have to reach any kind of conclusion, but whether we need spirituality, I have no doubt. And, uh, an atheist can have uh, spirituality, spirituality yeah. and an atheist could totally be very spiritual uh, in his or her uh, uh, approach to life. Um, so, but uh, uh, to me, uh, for, for good health, we have uh, science, uh, we have studies that show it is important. Spirituality mm -hmm. is important for human beings. And... Um, there has been a massive sort of cost of living crisis uh, around the world. Prices have been increasing um, and a lot of people are suffering in terms of having uh, food on the table, uh, paying their electricity bills, etc. cetera. Um, not just in the developing world, but also in the developed world, right? Like even in the United Kingdom. So what do you think in uh, any, what do you think, do you think that, do you have any sort of thoughts on how any of this can be alleviated or uh, be made better or anything along those lines? I think it will go into a very political arena, okay. Okay. Uh, but I, I do believe that um, there's too much inequality in the world and inequality also in the developed world is increasing. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the UK, uh, a lot of people are struggling uh, and they are having issues paying their heating bills mm. and uh, f affording food and 
I think all the while we have these multinational corporations making uh, very handsome profits. Uh, so uh, I do think that somewhere maybe that uh, the welfare state uh, is not working as well as it uh, used to, in, whether it's the UK and it could be the same situation in Scandinavia. Um, although things are much better in Scandinavia, yes. But I do think uh, there's a lot of despair and uh, I do believe that uh, we need some kind of wealth distribution uh, and uh, uh, I would want it here in Pakistan also. Uh, we need more wealth distribution. Uh, of course, it's better in the UK or uh, Scandinavia, but uh, I think overall in the world we are moving towards uh, more in inequality and uh, that also means maybe we uh, people that are relatively well off i think i could count myself amongst them maybe we have uh, a lack of understanding of how tough life can be for people that are unemployed for people that may not have uh, a very good network that may not be able to actually have their network, their friends and families uh, support them when they need it. Um, and I think uh, people that are better off too often kind of look down upon, upon people that uh, are not as fortunate uh, as themselves. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. And my last question um, is, what do you think is the purpose of life? Uh, I think that's a very big question. I'm not sure I could uh, answer that, but I think it's trying to live life with all the flaws that we as humans have and try to make the best of it. And uh, if... Uh, if there were to be any kind of moral value for me, it would be that try not to uh, hurt other people if you can avoid it. Uh, I'm not sure uh, anybody can say that they've been able to do that throughout their lives. We, we are humans, we make mistakes. But I think that's an important value for me. And whether it's the purpose of life, I'm not sure. But uh, I think at least it's a very important aspect of life that you try to treat people the best possible you can. Thank you, Dad. It was a pleasure to have you on. And you. I look forward to have you on again one day. Thank you for coming on the show. This was the Interstellar Podcast with Shreya Hussain. Please like, share, and subscribe, and click the notification button. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again.